and we now have a better mix on core than we used to. And we're thinking we need to do something similar with uh, um, Source Manager so that people know how to, for example, deal with troublesome people. Um, that's something that you learn by fire. Um, yes. And it's also something that you can learn a little bit by observing. So um, that's one of the things that we hope some of the workers will be able to learn from as well. Um, just so that we can, uh, you know, see what you need to do. Because a lot of times dealing with troublesome people isn't, you've been really naughty, you must behave now. Although no, those would be the easy ones. If those are the easy ones. If it was ones. just that, it's easy to if it was, just, if, just, and, just and if they didn't behave, <laughs> That's easy, <laughs> but usually it's, you know, the situations develop over months or years, people are not too bad at first, but become more toxic, and how do you, over time, provide timely feedback uh, yes. that they can deal with that's not, um, that, you know, that's more peer-to-peer -peer and not, you know, I'm your manager, I'm the, this big power in the project, and you got to do this. That never works. Um, so, you know, learning some of those soft skills is, is something um, that as you iterate through the harder and harder cases, um, you pick up and um, it can take a lot of time, which is one of the reasons I think doing that here for at least the internal source things would be very useful to help uh, give Core a little bit more time to focus on the longer term strategies and roadmaps and some of the initiatives they try to do each term. Uh, some of the other things we've been, or we've talked about is the Lurkers program also will be useful for ensuring that we have better continuity. One of the current quirks of our election system with CORE is we elect a new slate every two years, and so far, by accident more than intention, we tend to have some kind of overlap between teams so that there's some level of continuity. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are hoping to enforce a scheme, or well, not enforce, we are hoping to set the culture of a habit where we have people kind of rotating on and off and not the whole team at a time, so allowing continuity over time as the team changes its who's, who's active and who's kind of leading the charge as the years roll on. Right, it's also a more flexible uh, structure so that people can rotate in and out at pretty much any time. With core, it has to be an election and every two years, and if you get elected and then have a life change, you disappear. And we've had several core members over the years, you know, have that happen. It, it's, it's, it's a life event that happens or work gets busy or whatever and they're not able to spend the time they thought they would um, uh, going on. And it also makes it easier for people to drop off. Hey, I gotta wait two years to get back on. I'm not gonna drop off right now. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay with it even though maybe I don't have time. It helps um, set better boundaries for people um, or better expectations that if you're here, you're here and if you don't you know, if you need to go away, you can go away and come back, and it's not a huge barrier either way. Yeah, you're not risking a constitutional crisis of the core team having to force a new election because you stepped away or, or drama like that. Right, to, to formalize it. So a lot of people have not wanted the drama, so they just kind of quietly... Quietly set, disappear and just aren't active. <laughs> and and that's, that's no good either. Um, <clears throat> so one of the other things, why don't, why don't you talk about um, some of the ideas we've had for having more open uh, meetings so people know what's going on and what's cooking and uh, can participate uh, and make things a little less opaque than they have been with everything, um, you know, with the project to date. Well, and certainly in part because Source Manager, we're going to be focused on source specific things. So in fact, a lot of what we've been doing and many of the meetings we've been having is we're kind of figuring out what we're going to do and how we're organizing and what our, our kind of roles are, what our goals are. Um, we want to be more proactive in actually addressing things in the source tree. So like a practical thing we've done quite a, several times is we'll attempt to go through the backlog of the most recent bugs of the last two weeks because we've been meeting like every other week. Um, mostly. <laughs> uh, but we'll like spend time just going through those bugs and triaging them directly and trying to find uh, either something that one of us can take um, or seeing if we know somebody that we think we can assign a bug to and just trying to kind of build um, some first-hand, some better first-hand experience of ourselves doing that to help to find better policy and strategies for what are effective in source land specifically <coughs> for dealing with those things. Um, and also similar, uh, you've done a lot of work with pull requests. I know we've done, we've looked at some of those also in some of our calls. But those are things that 
that's not just source manager people having to do, but it's something we want to kind of wave the flag and show this is how you do it, this is kind of best practices, and, and demonstrate not just by, like, show how to do it as opposed to just sit, write words about how to do it. Right, exactly. Have kind of a, a first-hand experience so that we can write kind of a best practices doc, um, but also um, understand one of the hard things for me is, oh, I can fix that bug. Oh, I can fix that bug. <laughs> Well, I could fix that bug. <clears throat> but only but so many of them. <laughs> but, you know, the, I only have so much time. Um, and I, I hate to say that with my chain of command is sitting in the <laughs> audience. You know, it's, it's very easy to, to, to get overcommitted on time doing that. And one of the things I've noticed is like, oh, we, our role isn't to make sure that they get fixed. It's to make sure that they haven't fallen on the floor. This is an important bug. Someone should be looking at it. Who should be doing that? Or, yeah, this bug isn't that important. It's kind of interesting. We'll let the normal processes take their, their normal course with it. And, and, uh, or, or being realistic about what capacity as a project do we have. Right. And we can only, if we're only going to be able to handle X amount of load, mm -hmm. then we've got to filter for what are the highest quality X and be realistic about the fact that we're never going to get to the rest. And, right. And be honest about that with submitters to encourage them either to have higher quality inputs into our system or just don't set false expectations, have them waiting around for something that we just don't have the capacity to deal with. Well, especially with contributions. There's, there's a lot of contributions that we've looked at at the past and um, you know, it's like a, a volunteer line where everybody takes a step back because they don't want to <laughs> be stuck with it. Or you know, everybody looks at it and go, yours, and it falls on the floor. And nobody picks it up. And, and so having a, yeah, this patch doesn't meet our quality standards, or here's some feedback, um, I think is a useful thing that we need to add. It's one of the things I want to do with pull requests, is to maybe automate some of that, maybe get some of that um, happening more quickly. So the mechanical things, I don't want to spend my time telling people, you need a signed off by line on this, and this needs three more spaces or a hard tab. I want automation to do that. So when I look at it, it's um, you know, all the nuts and bolts distractions that, that we sometimes have are gone. And so, well, you want to review design, and you also, and you want to be able to tell people things like, um, I, I really appreciate this thing you've done, but it's really hard to review a giant new big thing. Right. You, like, we can't work with that very well historically. Yeah. We have to have things in smaller chunks from someone who is a new contributor. That's just kind of how it works best for us. Right. And so, um, you know, how, how, you know, being able to set expectations and limits and whatnot around that also helps us. Um, get more people in and have a higher quality conversation with them when, you know, they arrive. Okay. I guess, I guess the choice was made for us. <laughs> All right, Dave is up. With two microphones again. Hi, Walter. Yeah. Hey, David, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. So one of the questions I had for you is, um, how do you how do you think of the patches that should we put patches into current earlier? Um, sometimes they sit on reviews for um, a long, long time, and it seems a shame that they languish there. Big ones or small ones? Should um, we make more current? Yes, more, I think we more should. More active. I think uh, so. The, I have I have a couple of thoughts with that. Um, uh, one set of thoughts for current developers you know, people that have already made it through the process and can commit directly. And there, um, I think things are working okay. They can maybe push things in a little quicker. We break a few things. If we had better CI, we could try to push things in faster mm -hmm. because the risk is lower. Right now, people are a little hesitant. Um, so that suggests if we want to do that, we need to work on automating CIs somehow. Um, I know that, uh, Baptiste is working on a way that we can do uh, push, basically pull requests, or basically a push request that has the CI run on it so we can then evaluate it. Mm. Um, and that kind of ties into what I've been doing with GitHub. For new contributors, I think we absolutely should do it faster. Um, uh, right now, a big problem with Fabricator is nobody looks at it. You don't I know, know there the are a few people. Yeah, yeah, there are a few people that I mean, I get all the email, and I can't really do anything with that. But we don't have groups that look for storage things or network things. 
um, in general. So if you're a new person and you submit it, it hits there and like I was saying earlier, it falls on the floor and nobody mm. deals with that. And absolutely those we should get in faster or we should say, yeah, that's a very nice thing. It doesn't meet our, our standards. Here's how it doesn't meet our standards. Um, or this isn't something the project will ever do. You know, if somebody submits something that brings Perl back to the base system, we don't need to look at that very long to say, you know, we're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I absolutely think that we need to better engagement with the, the patch ingest. Um, not only does it make the project better because we get more things in, um, technically, I think it makes it better socially. It becomes a more social interaction with people. Um, the social interaction was what created the community in the early days. People mm. would, were talking all the time. They were doing things. There was quick feedback, even if it was at times, uh, I'll just go with uh, dysfunctional and toxic. <laughs> um, usually it was pretty good. Yeah. And so if we can bring some of that back, even if we get it wrong sometimes, um, I think that would be useful. Um, Alice's talk yesterday um, pointed to that, and maybe we can start getting some metrics around that, but we need to start doing it mm. first. We need to have kind of a coherent plan uh, for tooling. You know, Fabricator is optimized great for um, current developers, but terrible for contributors. Um, GitHub is better for current contributors, but the current developers don't look at it, and for larger patches that Fabricator does okay with, it, can stack much it doesn't, yeah. some people don't like it so much. Uh, there are always Garrett fans, I always have to mention that, um, and are always Garrett haters. So we, we need to figure out something to pull these all together mm -hmm. so we don't, we're, we're currently balkanizing ourselves out of useful contributions and contributors and, and, and new people. You know, not everybody that submits a patch is gonna stick around, but some people will. And, and there's a lot of people that I've talked to over the years, hey, I submitted a patch and I lost interest because nobody did anything. I might have been more interested, but you know, this other group I got interested in. So yeah. you know, that's you know, uh, around that, I think we need to have better engagement and better coordination. Um, maybe better leadership from core on some of these things. You know, how, you know, what do we delegate to port manager and source manager and doc manager to do to improve their workflows? Um, but also how do we make sure that there's not rough edges between them? You know, we've tried to remove the committer types between them so that you can flow back and forth. And if people are, hey, I got a doc commit today and I got a patch to a manual and I, oh, this port needs updating. You know, those are all things that mm. conceivably one person might want to do, but if we make three steep mountains that they have to climb to, to do simple things, they're not going to do it. So how do we work towards that? How do we make progress on that? How do we um, make sure that things keep moving? Um, I think are going to be challenges for uh, you know, everybody in leadership in the project. It's a part of that as a technical thing and also part of it as a social thing. So if I think back to my first bug report for FreeBSD it was a patch for a port, a new port that I wanted, and I couldn't figure it out. It was some Java stuff I didn't know, and I asked for help, and someone said, look, you need to come with a working patch, and it's closed it, and that's fine. I'm, I'm not a, um, a soft little puppy. I'm a long-time open source contributor, and I knew what they meant, and I think it took maybe, maybe about a year or so to get around, and I came back and eventually got in, and I think that early feedback is important. It doesn't have to be... Um, yes, we'll take your patch and clean up, but also be, hey, you need to do a bit more work, but thank you for your time. And that initial feedback is really important. <coughs> you can see people send pull requests and they sit open for months, months or years, that um, that's really harmful for the project with the person and we lose that on ramp. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, there have been a few people that, as soon as I landed their first patch, there were five more. Exactly. And then yeah. I, did, I landed those, and they're, you know, they've done like 30, and I'm trying to figure out how to get um, them mm. you know, onboarded in the, with the docs people. I haven't been able to, uh, mostly it's time on my part, but you know, I haven't been able to, to close the loop on that to get the right, make the right introductions and so forth, because you know, I've got other stuff I'm more interested in, but yet there's this person. So I don't want to be the only single point of failure. I want to, like I was trying to say in the, um, lightning talk. I mm. want to make it so that anybody can do this or 
you know, some large group of people can do this um, because some of the operations are a little dangerous. Um, but, you know, we trust the uh, committers right now uh, with the tree, as long as we can trust them to run these scripts, um, then we should be fine. Yeah, so, the, the social aspect of uh, committers but, is a trust-based thing, and we well, should give as much um, leeway as possible right, to let I people do I don't do want to be thing. the gatekeeper, yeah. and, and I am right now, mm. and I don't like that, but also the, tool, the, the, the tooling to um, get a good impedance match between FreeBSD fussiness and GitHub fussiness is, is a little bit more than I had hoped. Mm. Um, and, you know, we can't just say, oh, we're just going to go, get, go GitHub because that's going to alienate people. We're not a large enough community we can alienate people. But at the same time, we need to make people, get people out of their comfort zone because we do need to change because what's, wor what's working or what we've been doing hasn't really been um, working as effectively as it could. You know, we, we're, we're clearly an aging project. Um, we clearly have a bunch of patches. We, we clearly have blow-ups on the list. Hey, I submitted this three months ago. What the hell, guys? Or worse. Well, sometimes years. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah. years. And so, you know, we don't, you know, that tells us, tells me the project needs some oversight on these areas, and we don't have that. And we need to grow a community of people interested in doing that. Um, and, you know, to grow that community, we need to grow just the normal community. We've neglected that for the, the last few years. We have some new people. Mm. We need to, to, to get more and to have more, um, you know, have, have a larger pool from which to, you know, pull these different, more specialized skill sets. Because some of these things, you know, some of the things that we're, oversight we're looking for, that's not a technical skill, does this compile or not. You know, it's a more of a kind of a people skill. Even if you don't know how to fix that, you still need to give feedback. Hey, mm. this looks good. I'll ask so and so to look at it and maybe make introductions or you know do those sorts of things, which you know we don't have any guidance for right now. We don't have any docs to tell people how to be helpful in this way. Um, we just say, hey, submit patches this way. So you know, there's some. And then the magic behind the curtain happens. And magic Wizard behind of, the curtain. Was it of Oz style? Yeah, the magic behind the curtain happens, and we uh, get thrown out of the bar for making too big a mess and whatever. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. no. Exactly. The, um, the magic isn't documented, and the magic goes away when people go away. Mm -hmm. And so the magic needs to be documented, and we need to have more people rotating in and out because you learn by doing. You learn by being part of the community. Um, you learn, um, you know, the, the community becomes better. We're able to build a healthier uh, community because if you know we have a larger community, when people are misbehaving, we can mm. have the conversation. This isn't the community we want to have. These are the things that you're doing that perhaps might not be serving so the community well, yeah. or you know, we can have those conversations more easily when we're uh, when our the health of the community is higher. So, Whoops, I guess I cool. have to stop talking yeah. now. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Here you go. To Enjoy. Visit. Thank you, sir. I leave it in capable hands. Quite, thank you. <coughs> Michael, have a seat. Thank Welcome. You. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. So one of the questions I had for, for you was um, my other open source project is in the Apache, Apache Foundation, and it's Apache CouchDB. And one of the things I really liked about that community is we had a had and have a, a very strong culture of how we behave in public um, and, and also in private. Uh, it's a very, very diverse community, much more so than, than our FreeBSD one, unfortunately. And uh, one of the things that happened in that community is we don't tend to have these explosions on the mailing list and we all know what these explosions are and we've probably all contributed to them um, or if not contributed, at least warmed our hands on the fire. Here we go again. And in these threads, what happens is there's a maybe a technical question or something at the beginning, it, perhaps a bike shed, everyone feels the need to comment, then it gets heated, then it gets personal, then it gets forked, and we now have two threads going, and you're wondering which one of these we, we should try and deal with. So what worked really well in the Apache Foundation, I found, was people would reply to that inflammatory part and say straight away, 
that's not how we behave around here. And it was a very specific phrase. And when you saw that, it was a message to you say, hey, we, we know you're a nice person, but right now you're not doing that. And that's harmful for you and for us. And that thread would just die. But the person who also posted back the, we don't do that round here, would also then take up the mantle of saying, okay, how do I get this back on track? Where was the technical bit, the interesting bit, the bit that was relevant? Um, how do you think that would work for us? Would that help? <coughs> Thank you, Dave. And apologize, apologies, my voice is kind of struggling. Masculine, <laughs> masculine. Very, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, very white here. So many years ago, I found some obscure project and thought, my God, that's a good government's guideline. It was maybe a little database. And someone later pointed out like, oh, that's just cookie cutter Apache. Apache has some very good, a great framework for projects. And they've had enough corporate involvement, probably more comf closer than they're comfortable, but mm. that's helped shepherd them for a decade or two forward. And that's made for this structure to operate within. And of course, the famous plus one, which you need not say a lot to, to show your support. And so in that, I believe the, the Apache projects are required to follow their license, their governance, and a bunch of things that, you know, FreeBSD suffers from being at it for, what, 30 years? I mean, mm -hmm. they, did they even call it open source when FreeBSD started? So, exactly. So we had to invent it and make it up as we go, as so many of us in this room have just made stuff up as we go, because that's tech leadership. Well. Um, I haven't looked at how Apache guide governance handles the non-technical issues, but as we sit in a dev summit with someone worrying about flowers, someone worrying about water, someone worrying about the AV, which is somewhat technical, but it's a lot of negotiating with the venue, trust me. <laughs> so the non-technical issues are absolutely everywhere, and FreeBSD by design doesn't leave room for them. You mm. must have a commitment to be in a leadership position, which in my observation is a confusion of authority for leadership. There are some fantastic leaders with commitments. Mm. There are some fantastic leaders without commitments. Don't worry about the commitment. It's, it's, it's a, my dog could have a commitment. Probably a terrible developer, but may she rest in peace. So embrace the fact that there are very, very important non-technical issues. And if you really want to get sensitive on those, money. Mm -hmm. Money is a very sensitive topic, more so than schedulers and kernels. And, and the, the new language of choice, be it Go, be it Rust, be it Zig, be it, what's the next one? And let's just keep following that, that hotness. So I would hope the project, who's blessed with a very long-term foundation, I mean, I'm sure people thought Justin was crazy to propose that in, what, 2000 or around 1999 to have the idea of a foundation for an open source project that goes the extra mile to be public benefit so that you don't have license changes and CentOS being taken away from you, which, mm. the, I mean, let's, let's say, let's, let's have a, a definitive, perfect, industrial, ready open source project and then just have it taken away. And it's like... That won't happen when there's a foundation protecting a trademark and be it licensing, be it whatever. It's just that drama won't, isn't in the cards. Well, and that's I, a good I think thing. Foundations do have a risk that their, um, their governance needs to be continually aligned with their community. And it's very easy for, um, uh, for the sort of takeover you, you talk about to take happen. Takeover, wait, I didn't use that word. Sorry? Did you say takeover? Um, Yes, I was actually thinking of the Node.js debacle um, from oh, perfect, 10, great. 15 years ago, I think. There you now, go, yeah, about and a takeover, yes. yes yeah. Oh, and, not something here. And <laughs> in that situation, the community forked um, the code, then after a period of time, everyone agreed that that was silly and they should fix the problems and they merged, merged the community back again, and it's quite easy for that to happen. Um, it depends on the size of the project. If the project is big enough, like FreeBSD, you have a large number of core developers, I think you're a lot. You're not nearly as risk. You're not as much at risk of that, but in a smaller community, it is. Yeah. Uh, and they successfully brought things back to where they should be, or wanted yeah. to be, or perhaps yes. improved. That yeah, is much, great much improved. because, yeah. okay, um, 
all of us are on a spectrum of some kind. I've never been diagnosed, but to, be, to have the patience to deal with these technologies, it's statistically important. <laughs> and so you get the bluntness of email communication. You get the bluntness of just direct, to the point discussions when there's not the soft, gentle hand-holding surrounding the criticism of your scheduler patch, mm -hmm. which we just have to be patient, as you mentioned, in the patch emailing list. If something comes out, it's like, whoa, time out. First things first. And on that very point, your community is only as good as the worst behavior it tolerates. And yeah, so look around to each other and it's like, yeah. okay, how should we say hello? How should we do this, that? Comment on reviews, whatever, all of it. Choose flowers, all those non-technical issues. I mean, it's complicated. So I, I definitely agree with that. The the um, the way I would describe it is the behaviour of your community that you see is the culture, not the one that you wrote down in a code of conduct. And um, personally, I'm for code of conduct. It gives you a clear point of reference that says this is the last straw. If you get to this point, then we really are in trouble. Don't but make prior, me tap the sign. Exactly. Don't make me tap the sign. But prior to that, there's a long period of where people go, oh, that person is always like that, that's fine. Um, and they're one of us. And, and <laughs> exactly, implicitly, and we accept that behavior. Yeah. Mm. Uh, don't make me tap the sign. So <laughs> I think of another project that I was involved in many years ago, and I joined their governance structure, and I thought it would just be like the rest of the project, and I discovered it was fundamentally toxic. And I was horrified that these people I knew and respected and um, took the time to get to know in real life, who are mostly just fine, would allow this behavior on, on this mailing list. And that's a great shame. It does a great damage to the brand and it's really hard to come back with. So um, if people haven't seen this, there's a wonderful talk from two people in the Apache Foundation, Carl Fogel and someone else whose name escapes me, called Dealing with Toxic People in Open Source Communities. I think that's the title, it's probably 15 years old Sounds now, about right. but it's one of those things that we should probably all watch every couple of years and go, that's right, mumble, mumble, don't do that. Yeah. But it's hard, and from the outside we never know with people whether they're going through <coughs> difficult life situations, um, uh, health issues, and all we see is the behaviour on the mailing list and therefore we assume that this person is evil and we must reply, we must reply to it and correct them publicly, and that's not the right approach. I have one simple metric I've developed over all these years. Just watch for malice. People can be weird as heck, mm. but if they're not malicious, just find a way to find a place for them and how to engage with them and work with them because mm. they might be so far deep in a spectrum that they almost need a moderator handler. Well, provide that non-technical service rather than just have them scare off people. And about that, I mentioned CentOS. Um, does anyone know Rob Norris? Eva Winterschein and others and Tara? The time is right to attract Linux refugees. They're fed up, they're like, okay, we're done. This is too painful, this is not fun. These are brilliant people. These are unbiased people. These are people with great skills, great connections, great abilities. And you know, no horse in the race. They just want good technologies. And Rob came up with a like command line front end to Beehive where you can control C quit it just and it's transparently a hypervisor. It's check out his talk. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. I'm gonna hold the microphone so close you're all gonna hear it. <laughs> hey, Michael. Hello. How are you doing? Very good, and yourself? Yeah, I'm pretty good, thanks. Excellent. Do you have some topics to discuss, or um, see I where like, it takes us? I like the last one. I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> you were just talking about Linux refugees, and that reminded me oh, of, yes. of um, I don't know where I heard it, but apparently the best place to find an Olympic athlete for your sport is to go and poach one from another sport, because they already have, like, quite a lot of stuff that's transferable, like mindset. The onboarding is yeah, a lot yeah, shorter. Yeah, Thank you very works. much. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> so, um, Have you seen successes there? 
I'm not that involved with the Olympics. Well, these days, in technology and <laughs> art circles and. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've definitely seen people moving from project different from one project to another in open source, and that being like a really good source of new talent, and also people who can bring in um, new ways of doing things. And I've definitely s seen. So I've, I've been kind of in and around open source for quite a while, but I've never been super active in it until just the beginning of this year, really, hmm. um, because I got laid off in December. Oh, no. And um, I was like, well, I'm not ready to go back to work yet, but there's some stuff that I really I got started with and I wanted to do more with. Um, so I started getting involved with the, the to-do group, which is open a community a community of practice for open source program offices which is very horizontal as, as a as an organization as a domain so you've got people in industry um, and people in um, technology and, and all kinds of different you know people in academia and um, that actually sort of gave me a view into lots of different parts of the open source world um, because it's really for organizations that have open source program offices that are managing the use of open source and engagement of open source for, for a number, you know, for, for the company that, or, or the organization they work for. Um, and, and so I was able to really kind of see lots of different ways that open source works. Then I got involved with another open source project, um, which was the one I talked about yesterday, the Chaos Project. And I think they run their community really, really well. And to your point about um, communities, like the behaviors that people do when there aren't any rules, and sometimes when there are rules as well. Um, and I've definitely had people from, I'll get back to the question you asked, which is have I seen people moving from one project to another, which I have. Um, I've had people asking me, how do I get involved with a free BSD project? So people in chaos, particularly from Chaos Africa, where I have to say that the, the tech professionals in Africa are hungry, hungry to get involved with open source. Mm. They are, have so much ambition, they have so much talent, they have so much energy, and they're looking for places that need help. And I've had several people come to me and say, you're doing something with FreeBSD, how do I get involved? Interesting. And their skills may not be um, in the programming side of things. It's going to be more, um, sorry, pro programming, not program management. Um, their skills are more likely to be in um, web development or um, even we've, we've had got some accessibility designers, which is why I was asking Alfonso the question yesterday about do we need more help? And I'm not sure, I've tried to figure out how to get people involved with the FreeBSD project, and it's, I'm not sure what the obvious answer is for people who are not already familiar with it, which is a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? Dear audience, oh, <laughs> Watson, uh, what's the status of TeachBSD and other teaching resources? Because just last week or so, a gentleman in, Ar in Armenia, I'll give you one guess, said there are hacker spaces around the country and we'd like something very accessible and cut down with something like Occam BSD. Thank you for making the build options work. You all rock. Um, so how can we have Raspberry Pi type class hardware or going old school, the one laptop per child type hardware that we can have anywhere in the world with, if you have permissively licensed documentation, you can translate it into a local language without lawyers at your door, which is kind of important, and that BSD model of permissive copyright works brilliantly for uh, Stuky giving high-end BGP tutorials for good money that are, air quotes, proprietary or pay-to-play, and then oh, the widest swath of basic information available in the widest swath of languages on, be it hardware like what Dave just showed, or Raspberry Pi going full circle here. So I think I've 
coming out of Taipei, talking to Maximiano Stucchi and others and Peter Henstein, I'd love to propose uh, FreeBSD training, which is a set of courses at the low end similar to the handbook, similar to the BSD certification, which took place years ago and some folks were involved in. I've, it came up just this week. And have that franchisable, if you will, zero cost of entry, permissively licensed resources that if you want to translate them to Swahili, translate them to Swahili and help out, be it through foundations or individuals or people with cultural roots to these different corners of the world, uh, be it in Gaelic, whatever. I mean, let's just paint that picture because the, the desire is there. I think there are three open source operating systems on planet Earth that are unified, useful operating systems. There's Illumos, OpenBSD, and FreeBSD for getting real work done. And there are those who will disagree with that, but when you have to build large networks or large infrastructure or large storage, there are not really a lot of choices out there for a go-to, straightforward solution, which, have you noticed that FreeBSD has native OpenZFS integration? I believe it's the only OS on the planet. It's got jails for decades. It's got a hypervisor, I heard. It's mm -hmm. got package base, finally. It's becoming really, really good, and thank you, everyone, who's making that happen. I mean, it would have been great to have package base with like 5.0, because hey, the new package came, let's just go that extra distance, but FreeBSD is becoming really, really good at a really good time. The moment they took away CentOS, it's like, okay, we have work to do. We, we, we need to do the thing. We're not OS engineers, we're not release engineers, we just need to like, make the insurance database work. I mean, un, unexciting things like that, but that's where the like, money and day-to-day -day stuff happens. So, I mean, pat yourselves on the back. It's just, you know, despite any challenges internally or externally, and things like cloud providers, they're like, oh yeah, we don't have any free BSD guests. Do you count them? No. And one, as someone pointed out on a call, they, they don't even count Linux guests, it's Windows guests. So every client is a Windows client, despite the fact that a small percentage are Windows clients. So we need to work with the cloud providers to get some real numbers, because it's out there. Does anyone watch Netflix? Anyone, anyone? It's like, FreeBSD is absolutely everywhere. It is moving mountains, it's storing petabytes, exabytes of data, but it's often invisible. And it's in that be bell, the, the bathtub curve of the noisy hobbyists and the vendors, it's kind of, kind of rough in the middle there. And if I was to beg for one thing, it would be uh, FreeBSD on Apple Silicon. It's very available, it's very fast, and tragically, Mike was talking to Kyle and could not continue that work. So if anyone is interested in Apple Silicon and FreeBSD, please just talk to one another amongst yourselves. The world could use that. Um, any other topics? <laughs> uh, how has FreeBSD treated you as a newcomer, a not dude, <laughs> um, yeah, a yeah. non-traditional participant? You can and call me dude, I don't mind. <laughs> hey dude. Um, I, I got into it only because I was asked to come in. Okay. So I didn't find it as much as I met Greg at a conference. We got on. I said, if you've got any work, just let me know. Okay. And he let me know a couple of weeks later. Right? Um, so I've come in through the foundation. I'm contracting with the foundation mm. um, part time. But I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic community and I think it's got a huge amount of potential. Where I, as I still have the new eyes, if you like, so I'm, <laughs> I'm still looking around going, oh, uh, how does that work? How does this work? Who are these people? I'm, I'm starting to get to know people. Um, you know, we've, we've been on multiple calls. Thank you, and I'll say that objectivity as a newcomer is critical because we, well, we, everyone's on a first name basis, so yeah, right. that's not always constructive. I'm like, who is DCH? Yeah, DCH, what, what, what is a DCH? <laughs> What's one of those? Thank you, Benedict. Hi, Alice. Hi, Joe. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> good, thank you. What good. do you want to talk about? <laughs> um, hmm. 
one of us is going to have to come up with a, a, a question, right? Hmm. Anyone got questions to get us started? Maybe maybe we can talk about the, the projects that you're involved with. Like I think you're doing a little bit with Alpha Omega and the Sovereign Tech Fund. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about those if you want. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a spreadsheet and everything's in progress. And the dates that I put in the spreadsheet are still on track, so it's all good. Um, yeah, Alpha Omega has, I got, I, it was already in progress when I started. Um, working with the foundation um, and one of the things that I found has been pretty interesting about how these projects are work or how these yeah how these projects are working is like how it's basically a collaboration so the, the money is is invested to achieve something that's that's been agreed up front um, and then the, thing, the things that have been asked for are supposed to happen, which they are happening. Um, but equally, there are, what I found really interesting about it is that it's also about building a, um, what would be the right word, but building skills within the open source community to do some of these things. So we were, we've been encouraged to talk with the Eclipse Foundation as the FreeBSD Free Foundation to learn more about how they've done, you know, multi-factor authentication pilots, for example. And I know that when we've been working with the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is very, very new, and we've just started rolling out that program, we've, one of the things that we specifically have to do <laughs> is um, provide a narrative as to how we found um, running the program, because the Sover Sovereign Tech Fund is, trying to create a new engagement model for um, public bodies or publicly funded bodies with open source or equivalent organizations, projects and foundations. And what they want to know is, is it working? <laughs> so they're, they're asking for every time we submit um, like an invoice and a report, that they want, they want to know, you know, what did we do? How did we find it? Where was it difficult? Where are their lessons learned? And they want all of that to become essentially quite, quite shared and quite public. Um, so that's really interesting. And, and you know, we're all going to learn a lot from that, I think. So it's interesting that these projects are not just about, you know, donations or, or investments going into producing an outcome. Um, it's also about building skills and knowledge within the overall world of open source and, and um, um, public commons, I suppose. So who, who is the Sovereign Tech Fund, it, or not Sovereign Tech Fund, Alpha Omega? It, I think Ed said, so I haven't been that involved or almost not at all involved in Alpha Omega, but um, from brief conversations with Ed, it's a consortium of large tech companies who've really leveraged open source and want to give and, and really profited immensely um, from open source and they want to give something back. And I think it was started by some former Google employee. I don't remember the name. Um, so that contrasts with the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is the German government recognizing that open source is really valuable. Um, but there's not too many Alpha Omegas, so governments have a place to do something good and fund these open source projects. Um, did I get that right about Alpha Omega? Do you know? Alpha Omega, um, the money comes from AWS, Microsoft, and Google, um, but it's actually a sister project to the Open SSF project, which okay. is a Linux Foundation project. Right. It's kind of like projects all the way down because <laughs> you've got the Linux Foundation and then you've got OpenSSF, which is a Linux Foundation project, I think, or I'm not completely sure how they like to categorize those. But anyway, and then Alpha Omega is, I think, essentially a program that, that sits underneath that. Okay. But yeah, the money for it comes from, from the hyperscalers. Um, 
it might be altruistic, um, or it might be a little bit of that, and you know, a little bit from column A, a little bit of column B. Column B being that there's quite a lot of new regulation coming out about um, security of um, various. I mean, I, I know there's um, European and US regulation coming out around security of software, and I think if you use various components that can't easily be swapped out, then in, then you can't just pick one that's more secure, you have to invest in making the one you use more secure. And I think that's probably one of the motivating reasons why something like the Alpha and Omega project is happening. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> and I think so far we've engaged with a company, Synactic, Yes, yes, so um, I know Ed mentioned Synactive yesterday, they're based out of France. Um, they do all kinds of security work, I believe. I'm not uh, super familiar with everything they do, but they did the code audit for us and provided us with weekly updates and reports and things like that. And I know Pierre has been working with them. I'm not sure exactly That's what right. Pierre's doing, but he's something with the fallout from the audits, Pierre's uh, helping to tackle those. Yeah, so Synactive provided a, so they looked at Capsicum and they looked at Beehive and for each one they um, essentially were looking for, for well for, for Beehive they were looking for, um, I'm going to get this right around, yeah for looking for um, uh, any, anywhere that you could escape the VM basically and, and get to the kernel. For uh, Capsicum I guess it was kind of similar because they're both sort of controlled um, ring fenced environments that you're not supposed to be able to get out of. Um, Beehive, I think, was a lot of a, a smaller surface area for them to analyze than Capsicum, um, but they essentially were able to discover a number of vulnerabilities. Some of them were, were quite high um, severity and some of them less so. Um, Pierre's role has been to work with those reports, log them all into Fabricator with, um, if possible, proposed solutions or patches. Um, and work with the subsystem teams to implement the, either the patches that he suggests or better, you know, better solutions mm -hmm. if it's not his area of expertise. And he's he's basically been, you know, managing the um, the vulnerabilities on the ground, if you like. Yeah, and I think we we've seen a few more uh, essays than normal, and I think we might continue to see more uh, essays coming up. Um, Maybe, do you want to talk about the Sovereign Tech Fund? Um, I, yeah, I can do. Um, so the Sovereign Tech Fund is um, an organization that is was created, I think, last year, or perhaps uh, in the year before. It started off with a pilot, and it's a, it's a German organization, um, which is a, I guess, a government, I guess it's a government organization, or at least it's um, a sort of, government um, governed, <laughs> I'm, not used, I'm not sure what the right word is, but like government controlled organization. It says the federal something of Germany. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'm not totally sure how, how that stuff works over there. Um, but it has a mission basically to improve um, technical infrastructure for the common good or something along those lines. Um, and so they, they're trying to create this engagement model where they Instead of making donations, they really don't like us to use the word donations or um, anything like that. They prefer to see it as being much more like a commercial contract where they commission work to be done, um, which obviously to them has a, um, there's, a, there's, a def there's a difference between those two things. I'm not completely sure ha what the difference is in the way that they're thinking about it. Um, but um, but you wanted me to talk about the, the work that we're doing. Well, I think the, the first theme is reduction in technical debt. Do you know much about how specifically? I, I have a few ideas, but I think you're more involved, so. Yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, so we have five work packages, A through E, for the Sovereign Tech Fund. The first one is just for this year. Um, so it runs from basically now, or a couple of weeks ago, 
all the way through December, probably into January a bit, because we didn't get started as early as we wanted. Um, and that is about technical debt reduction, which is broadly around... And so I think that's going to involve a lot of uh, bug triage going into Bugzilla and trying to reduce the ungodly number of bugs that yes, have been sitting there the for a trust. long time. And Oh, you're back, John. Yep. What do you want to talk about? I don't know. The weather in Halifax? Um, well, I'm not there, so I don't know what it's like. <laughs> um, hmm. So what do you think about the projects the foundation uh, is funding right now? So I, c I can, well, we're funding a number of contractors for longer terms now. I, I, think, I think the foundation has, um, I don't want to say, say this disparaging, I don't mean it, but we've often funded very specific things that are short duration, but some of these problems, some big problems take more time. Like you can't just rush through them. In, in you know, software development, you know very well, it's really hard to predict timelines sometimes because there's always unexpected things. So I think recently we've started um, a few contracts that are longer, so like a year or two years, uh, with the hope that bigger problems can be solved. Like there's, there's time for more explore, exploration, maybe even a bit more research. Um, so what do you think about some of the current contracts uh, we have open, like Olivier, um, uh, Isaac Freund, the new guy that, um, uh, is the lead developer for um, the River Wayland comp Compositor. Um, Christoph with the audio stuff. Do you have any thoughts about uh, like the, the current contracts? I, I had no idea about the middle one that you mentioned. Um, Isaac? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's only starting October 1st. Okay. Well, I mean, I, so I like what you said. I mean, I, I think there's definitely truth. I understand it is maybe easier to measure a smaller project with a short list of milestones where you can, you can evaluate early on how things are going. And it, it's, it's a bounded thing. It's easier to manage a project that's smaller. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right that certainly we don't only have small problems, um, that we have long running tasks. Many of them take quite a bit of time to accomplish it and achieve. And it's something you could do in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, Having that mix of projects and getting, you know, for yourself having the experience of doing longer term projects and managing those um, and whatever that's like for you. I'm not always fun, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but, <Various>. I, <laughs> well, uh, but yeah, I do think there are bigger projects that that's important to do. I, I think it's actually, um, um, Olivier has been doing some all sorts of things in the scheduler that are like in various places around, like, uh, it's like fixing lots of things all over the place is Whack kind of what I've seen it. Um, one, and, and things that are, uh, in some cases, they haven't risen up to be on someone's like itch to scratch. Um, so they haven't arisen naturally out, out of the community, some of the, of the volunteer tr choosing to work on it. Um, so they're good gaps to fill because they're things that have just been kind of sitting there. Um, and it's good work to to improve things like the, like using the all the bits for, well, all the cues for scheduling, some of the reviews I know you have going. So I think it's interesting stuff. It's always a balance between, I think, funding and people available and um, lots of different proposals come in and things like that. So more, more feedback, especially from, from the community at large or from core is, is always helpful. Yes, I know the foundation is always eager for direction from core. Um, that's a work in progress, clearly. Mm -hmm. What about, in your case, what, do you, what are things you run into that uh, are there, well, are there things you run into in FreeBSD, like using it yourself, that are annoyances <laughs> or bugs you run into or stuff? Or are there process things 
how the community interacts, how, how for you personally, when you're working within the community or how you've seen your previous experience being a very effective core secretary and the ugly insides of all that, what are things that you see that are maybe pain points or things that work well or not so well? Um, so I think we had it pretty lucky. Everybody tells me core 10 was pretty good. Um, and, and being Relatively the, speaking. <laughs> and being core secretary was not that hard. It was mostly stay out of your guys' way. And I think what I did the most was put a lot of effort. So the criticisms of core in the past have always been things are very opaque. So I tried very hard to um, share those those reports in with as much detail as possible. Um, other than that, like, I, I mostly stayed out of the way. Um, uh, but pain points for me, so for the community, I, I've kind of been a lurker for a long time or been around for a long time, so I've just kind of gotten used to the way things are, and so I don't really have that many pain points in terms of using FreeBSD. So I try very hard to only use FreeBSD like on my laptop and all my systems at home. Um, and I always like to talk about how I still run like a 13 year old laptop. So there are some pain points now like graphics, there's a few issues, but taking the time and debugging DRM, and, and I'm not even certain it's DRM, but um, so like um, when you switch, so I just found out today there's a workaround for this, but when you suspend the laptop, which I don't do very often because I don't travel very often, it wants to switch to one of the virtual terminals and there's a problem where you lose acceleration and some weird things happen. Um, so that, that was something that I just noticed here um, because I've suspended and then suddenly like I couldn't open my terminal application. Um, so um, wireless works reasonably well for me because I have such an old uh, wireless card, but I know, I hear from a lot of people that they're growing impatient with uh, some of the wireless stuff. Bjorn's working very hard and he's done a lot of good stuff to improve wireless stability. We still know that speed and this issue with suspend and resume needs to be fixed. Um, it's on the to-do list. Um, other pain points. Um, so, like I said, I almost exclus exclusively try to run FreeBSD. However, ironically, since I started with the foundation, I've had to have a, a Linux box because we do talk to a lot of companies and some, I don't think there's much we can do, but like Microsoft Teams will work one day and then two weeks later it suddenly doesn't work. So uh, Linux has somehow managed to um, do a little bit better at that. Um, that's all I can come up with right now. Um, generally works well for me. <clears throat> I must say that, so, <clears throat> I do most of my development work on FreeBSD, certainly at home. Um, that's my big box with multiple monitors and all my Emacs windows. Um, but I also have a Mac, because that's where I will use things like Zoom. Um, mm. And all the web hungry, the, in, the end copies of Chrome that are all the different instant messenger clients, I'm happy for my Mac to do that so that I can do my builds on a box that's not tangled up with that. Uh, and it's kind of hard to run PowerPoint on FreeBSD. And yep. I, I, I didn't used to care, but when I was teaching and having to write a lot of slides, um, suddenly all the other, like OpenOffice just didn't quite cut it anymore. And so now I'm, I, I definitely write slides in PowerPoint. Uh, and so the Mac is very useful for that. So for me, finding the right tools. But I, certainly I, like, I'm much more home writing code and doing most of my day-to-day -day stuff on my BSD box. Yeah. Depends on what you want to do. Another one that I thought of, and I've talked to Olivier about it, 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 you do learn a lot of things that you don't realize are problems until you switch to something else where it works better. Uh, so that's Arch for, um, for these uh, multimedia sessions or, or video conferencing sessions. But on Arch, I can open like 100, 200 tabs in Firefox and it's no problem. But on FreeBSD, I don't know if it's a Firefox issue or a FreeBSD issue, but after like 15 tabs, I often see the messages in our log messages about um, basically running out of memory. I can't remember the exact messages. Is it like where you hit out, of, run out of swap? Yeah. It really starts randomly killing things? Yeah, this just doesn't yeah. happen on Arch, but it happens on FreeBSD. But Olivier says at some point he's interested in this OOM issue and he might take a look at it. I'm not, sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm not <laughs> forcing you. 
Not that I have the authority or anything to tell you what to do, but. Uh, so how many tabs, so this is, a, this is a good, great, complete segue question. How many tabs do you have open on how many browsers? Oh. Uh, like normally? Well, on FreeBSD, not many, because I start running out of memory. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in general. Like, um, I mean, on, on the Arch system, I might get maybe 50, but, uh, but I have a friend. He's the one that convinced me when I was looking at Linux distributions for these uh, multimedia or, or video conferencing sessions. He uh, suggested I try Arch. It was always a joke that he had like a thousand tabs open on his system, and he somehow lost them recently. So you can have a lot of tabs open and not. See, some people have anxiety about certain things. I have anxiety about Safari deciding it's not going to reopen all my windows yeah. after a restart. Because I, so I, like on my Carbon, I have Firefox and probably has about 30 tabs or something ridiculous in it. But on my Mac, I think I have several workspaces and I probably have, I don't know, seven, eight different Safari windows. Most of them averaging around 20 tabs a piece or something. And it's really annoying also if you, if you, if you don't restart in the correct way, they all get moved to the first desktop when you restart. So, well, thank you, Benedict.